Hi, Paul. How are you? Thank you so much for dialing in from the Netherlands. How, whereabouts are you based in the Netherlands? Well, we are based uh, out of the southeast of the uh, Netherlands, uh, close to Eindhoven, the city of Eindhoven. So, very nice. And I, maybe I can briefly introduce you, given that you have a wealth of experience in the supply chain automation industry. You have about 25 years of experience and with your background in econometrics, but also a huge amount of execution and operational skills in the warehouse execution system market. I guess today we're going to learn about the company you co-founded with your business partner and your intergroup. Can you tell us a little bit about intergroup, why you started it, what you're looking to achieve with your company? Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, I studied econometrics uh, when I uh, graduated. Uh, I was 25 years old. Then I started uh, working with a company called uh, Wetron in uh, Germany. Um, well, with my uh, econometrics and operations research background, it suit, uh, suited me quite well. Uh, but after uh, five years, uh, around about that time, uh, we had lots of uh, uh, better ideas. So uh, that's the time then uh, uh, where we started uh, the company Intergroup. Uh, that was in 1998. Um, initially um, focusing on the field of warehouse uh, management systems, uh, more manually uh, oriented. But as we saw that uh, um, both ERP systems were getting more and more warehouse management functionality on board, uh, that actually pressed us more towards the, the shop floor uh, control systems. On the other hand, we also saw that uh, the uh, the requirements of our customers uh, for um, uh, manual um, uh, solutions uh, was getting higher and higher and uh, with that the uh, availability of uh, uh, the hands, uh, the, the, the people that actually perform the job on the work floor was increasing a lot. So um, uh, that also forced us into the field of uh, more and more mechanized uh, and robotized uh, solutions. And that's, uh, um, uh, I think, um, the, the line that we have been following since then. Um, so uh, where we started uh, with more manual solutions uh, today, we have uh, fully automated uh, solutions like uh, uh, shuttle systems, uh, mini loads, uh, goods to persons, uh, robotized uh, picking A-frames, uh, where the, uh, the need for, uh, for manual intervention is uh, well, minimized as much as possible. Got it. And can you tell us a little bit about the system integrators market and where you sit within that ecosystem? Because you, you essentially take everything and you do everything within the automation space. So can you give shed some light and yeah. you said in that? It is always important to have some focus uh, in what you do. Uh, that's what we learned in our uh, entrepreneurship uh, as well. We really focus on uh, high uh, volume distribution logistics. Um, where we uh, specifically focus on uh, uh, the piece uh, handling, uh, piece picking, handling, and uh, uh, um, and in that area, um, we uh, really focus on the, the, like I said, the high demand systems, but also uh, with some kind of complexity in it, and. Um, in, in that sense, uh, well, we uh, focus also then uh, to specific uh, industries like uh, pharmaceutical business, uh, the food, fashion, spare parts, uh, and both uh, with uh, uh, the, the online channel and uh, the wholesale uh, channel, or what they call it today, uh, an omni-channel uh, distribution uh, strategy. And... Can you tell us a little bit about the, your focus sectors? Um, what are the trends you're seeing right now? And what are the products that are being essentially pulled by the market? Yeah, um, what you see is that, um, like I just said, the, the, the high demand uh, for people that need to work in warehouses 
is uh, growing uh, dramatically and uh, especially with uh, the uh, actual uh, COVID uh, uh, situation that uh, we face everywhere in the whole world. Um, we uh, see that our customers are um, really looking at solutions where they lose uh, the, the real dependency, the real dependency of the, uh, uh, the work Mm -hmm. The real dependency uh, to the, the uh, not having people uh, on the work floor because you can understand as soon as we uh, uh, see that uh, a group of people are uh, really infected with the, the mm -hmm. coronavirus, uh, it's a problem <laughs> because uh, that means that uh, our customers sometimes uh, can perhaps only deliver 50% of their, uh, uh, their demand. So that's uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is what we see that um, the the demand for um, uh, well the, the online uh, demand that has been increasing uh, also dramatically in the, the, the past couple of years, and that has been even uh, influenced uh, dr dramatically uh, positively due to this COVID, means that uh, there uh, is much more. Um, uh, complexity complexity has uh, grown into warehouses um, which makes it uh, 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 yeah that we are in in, a, uh, in an environment with our solutions uh, uh, where we can uh, really add some value to our customers let's talk a little bit about the European market because we we hear quite regularly about what's happened in the US we hear a lot about China Japan uh, Germany, but let's talk about what's more broadly in Europe. Can you tell us a little bit about the automation processes of how advanced is Europe in the global landscape and specifically given that you are uh, essentially a European company, well, what does that mean? Are the, yeah. How do you fit in the landscape, competitive landscape? Yeah, what we do is um, as soon as we um, identify a potential uh, project, um, we go there and start looking at uh, what's happening uh, uh, at this time in the, in the warehouse. Uh, apart from that, we perform a, a data analysis. Um, and with that data analysis, we can uh, actually see um, what is the logistics characteristics of that cus uh, that customer or that project and uh, based on that uh, we see for instance uh, how is the order pro profile looking like um, uh, do they have a steep uh, Pareto curve you know with uh, the ABC articles uh, fast moving slow moving um, how fast uh, is it required that the customer can deliver the goods uh, because you can imagine in the online market it's very important whereas for instance in the medical uh, market it's more important not that speed but uh, the uh, reliability of uh, uh, of the deliveries so uh, there are um, even though it's all intra logistics automation but um, uh, for uh, for specific markets uh, industries you have uh, 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 different kinds of uh, objectives so uh, that's also the reason why uh, the uh, solutions that we provide uh, are practically never the same with uh, uh, other customers because they have different characteristics and different different objectives of what they want to reach so uh, well that's what we are seeing not only in Europe but uh, that's actually also true in the US or in China so with intra logistics and this para I think I when we first spoke I said you pretty much coined this term I, I'd like to understand which parts of the supply chain are do you see a lot of your customers turning to you and asking for greater automation uh, let's focus on Europe for a second and where do you think that there'll be an increasing demand for automation processes more essentially your products i'm not sure what you mean but uh, um, once the customer already has uh, decided where to have their uh, logistics hubs that's not our uh, cup of tea but okay. uh, as soon as they know uh, we are uh, working for a, a, a warehouse in this area and it needs to do 
global or a, a European or a, a national uh, distribution. Uh, everything within the four walls of a warehouse uh, that is uh, in our scope. Got it. Uh, that was really my my question. Uh, you know, how much of the delivery processes and uh, with the future of well, the future supply chain uh, and given the current disruption, how much do you think that Europeans will go online? How much more, uh, how much do you think, you know, the, how much behavioral change has there been? Um, well, that's a good question. I don't know how far uh, it will uh, uh, even develop further. Um, well, what I do know is that, uh, especially since uh, uh, everybody is online, uh, both uh, at home, but also uh, mobile, uh, I think um, that was actually a real prerequisite of uh, the online business, because we did some uh, customers uh, in the beginning of the, the zeros. And um, back then, not, uh, the, the availability of uh, internet and broadband internet was not there yet. So that was a reason that it was still very low. Uh, what we see today is that uh, this has been uh, growing very, very much. And I uh, think that, uh, again, with uh, the, the COVID, uh, uh, what we have today, uh, that even increased it more and more. But where it stops, that's a good question. I don't know. What about, let's talk about something that I think anyone who's in, in the industrial automation space has to address to the policymakers, to society as a whole. What is going to happen to labor and how much is this actually replacing jobs? Are there ways to increase more jobs? What is happening? How is this all working? How is the labor market developing? In yeah. Um, what we see is that uh, uh, the density of distribution centers uh, uh, is increasing, uh, meaning that uh, the demand uh, for labor uh, in uh, specific areas is growing very, very much. Uh, as an example, what we see uh, in the southeast of Netherlands, uh, where we live, uh, there's lots of uh, warehouses uh, popping up uh, from all different kinds of multinationals coming from all over the world. And um, uh, the, the um, but let's say, a more um, uh, simple um, jobs in warehouses, uh, like uh, truck driving or... Uh, uh, order picking or transportation um, is performed by uh, by people, um, but these people are not available. Uh, we see customers we have; they uh, are hiring uh, personnel to drive a forklift, uh, uh, and they have to travel uh, 200 kilometers every day, uh, and that really makes no sense. So. Um, what we see, and that's not only here, but we see that everywhere, the, um, the, the pressure on uh, people uh, who are not available uh, is, uh, is one. And the other thing is that the, um, the cost of labor mm -hmm. is uh, also increasing. Uh, here in Belgium, it's huge. In, in Norway, it's huge. And uh, these two um, um, phenomena um, uh, actually define the need of further automation. Uh, I already talked about, we mentioned uh, shuttle system, uh, ASRS uh, systems, robot picking. Um, this uh, actually diminishes uh, the requirement of uh, people, but it does not mean that we do not uh, need uh, any hands anymore. Uh, what we see is that um, this automation, uh, let's say, makes uh, uh, 70 or 80 percent of your uh, hands, uh, your, your hands uh, is uh, needed less. Uh, so uh, that's one thing. But also, what you see is that the uh, there is a shift of um, uh, activities that uh, or tasks that need to be performed in warehouses. So. Uh, instead of uh, these forklift dr uh, drivers, they are perhaps uh, more or less uh, um, problem solvers or uh, process engineers had to watch uh, at the whole system to see if it is still going well. So what is, 
what is the cost saving a you know distribution center might see or someone who owns a a number of distribution yeah. centers might see from your yeah. experience what we uh, uh, what we do is uh, 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 we try to uh, to sell a system as a system integrator. So uh, I just mentioned to you, we start with uh, this data analysis mm -hmm. and based on that, we set up a business proposal and uh, we tell the customer, um, we are going to supply you this scope mm -hmm. and, and it will cost, cost you this uh, amount of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, the customer uh, needs to do an investment but they never do that uh, just because they like us that much. Uh, of course, they need to uh, earn money with that so there's always a business case mm -hmm. and uh, i cannot say how much does it save it really depends on uh, what uh, well what the situation is with the customer but also what is the policy with the customer because for instance what you see in the united states states uh, that uh, the the number of um, uh, years uh, of your return on investment mm -hmm. is uh, less than two years uh, more often uh, even uh, one year so that means that the availability uh, to earn money in one year back uh, is not that huge. So the, the, that uh, actually defines the budget of automation where we see here sometimes uh, we have a return on investment of three years or five years or even longer. So that means that uh, the investment type um, more mechanized, more robotized, uh, but that means also more expensive. So um, in that sense, there, uh, there is a possibility to have much uh, more um, sophisticated solutions uh, in, in this area. What, so your customer base, is it primarily small, uh, small medium enterprises or the global corporations? I know, I know you have a project called Estee Lauder at the moment. Mm. So mm. Um, are the, your customers, do they all have to be conglomerates or what, what is the the yeah. customer for you? Well, uh, Lord is one of our customers, uh, but we have more multinational customers like uh, uh, Marshall uh, and uh, like uh, um, uh, HEMA. Uh, uh, most often uh, these, cu these customers or the, the, the enterprises are uh, bigger, but um, it is not so much important that they have a huge turnover. What is more important, and, and that's always one of our first questions, is um, how many people uh, do you have working on your shop floor? Yeah. And when the answer is uh, more than 50, uh, then I'm almost pretty positive that we uh, can uh, define a good business case. Got it. And so can you just go back I, I really think that you said the investing in intelligent decision making, um, essentially humans who are going to be making and solving problems. Can you tell us how much, you know, how much of a skills gap there currently is? Because I, there are around 22,000 PhDs in the world, let alone all these very intelligent people to work in warehouses and make these and solve these problems. So do you see that skills gap in Europe at all? Uh, well, what we see is in uh, the, the, the kind of solutions that we deploy, eh? for instance, in robot picking, uh, we make use of uh, these high skilled uh, people because they think of uh, new algorithms, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in artificial intelligence uh, in, in such a way that uh, our solutions are getting uh, smaller and smaller uh, and that uh, actually uh, uh, moves that border between automation and manual solutions. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And um, I guess for my un for the audience and my understanding, you're heavily focused on the North American market as well as Europe. Uh, can you tell us why that is and what is going to be your advantage? Well, um, we have uh, been developing a, a solution with our uh, warehouse control uh, and warehouse management software suite. Uh, which is called InterLC, and um, we also uh, have uh, 
a lot, a lot of uh, hybrid solutions uh, in our portfolio. Uh, we cover the whole uh, automation package from goods in to picking, storage, packing, and uh, goods out. Uh, but uh, for instance, for picking and packing, uh, we really focus to this uh, part because the uh, number of uh, employees working in warehouses um, are 50 uh, or 55 percent uh, picking and 30 percent to packing and for instance for picking uh, we have lots of different kinds of solutions like uh, robot picking uh, goods to person zone picking uh, pick by light rf picking so th there's a whole uh, different kinds of um, of solutions available that we can uh, uh, put to work in uh, in a particular project uh, we never uh, put all, uh, let's say, 10 different picking methodologies that we have uh, in, in one project, but we choose, huh? again, based on that data analysis. Mm -hmm. And we do actually the same for packing. Now, um, this uh, solution um, uh, package uh, we have available, and we feel that uh, we can uh, uh, pretty easily uh, deploy that to other markets as well. Um, it is important to know that uh, we uh, make use of this um, um, portfolio of different kind of solutions and we always um, uh, choose particular components and uh, configure that in such a way so that it suits like uh, a tailor-made jacket for our customer. So uh, it looks like, uh, well, we have a tailor-made solution, but all based with uh, standardized mm -hmm. products. And that makes it uh, uh, that we have, uh, well, a solution, a solutions available, not only for Europe, but also for the United mm -hmm. States or for uh, China your products because of course service is one piece and then product company is a different piece how let's say how can you scale this as a, how can you scale as a product company and are you looking to focus on one product scale it massively what is your model what is your business model well um all uh, our different uh, components uh, are uh, scalable uh, and um, th that is needed uh, because uh, what we most often do is uh, once we uh, define a project, uh, we are not uh, building a solution for uh, for today or for the next three years, but we envisage and we try to do that as good as possible. But that's very difficult because nobody knows what's actually happening in the future. But we always try to look uh, more ahead to five or to seven years uh, up front and uh, think, well, what is my dot on the horizon? Huh? What is it? Where are we going to? And once we know that, then we uh, see, okay, but for the now, for the next uh, two or three years, we do phase one and uh, then uh, up to uh, uh, year five, we do phase two. And uh, that is most often that we uh, set up some kind of a basis solution. And this basis solution is um, actually being uh, rolled out further uh, since our uh, components uh, are uh, really uh, scalable. <laughs> So you and your business partner started this company. Is your company fully private? What's your passion moving forward? What are you guys going to change? And well, what keeps you going, getting up every morning and creating <laughs> more efficiency? I mean, what is it that's driving you? Yeah. Um, what is driving is they want more projects in the range of 10 to 20 million euros. Mm -hmm. And to do that, uh, we've done a, a couple now, and to do that, you, you need volume, you need uh, a, a vast basis of um, stability. And uh, well, that is uh, where we are growing at. Um, we are um, um, growing every year with uh, more than uh, 30 percent mm -hmm. and uh, that makes it not only possible that in the end we do more and more of these kind of, of uh, projects but by doing that these projects are highly interesting in terms of well, complexity and there's really something going on eh? we, we do 
projects that uh, we are, our customers uh, handle uh, more than 10,000 order lines per hour, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is quite a lot. And um, with this, we have uh, uh, well uh, some. Uh, we are acting in in the range of solutions that uh, we bring very interesting and appealing work to our employees mm -hmm. and uh, I think that is also an important uh, part of doing business because uh, you uh, of course you need to uh, pay your employees well uh, and uh, but in the end uh, it's not uh, about the money anymore but it is about how uh, am I developing myself uh, in my uh, field of expertise and I think uh, we really uh, are um, providing that uh, possibility to our employees. And yes, uh, our company is still private. Uh, it's still privately owned by the two of us. Well, uh, very exciting to follow what you get up to and your, your growth moving forward. And is there one final piece you'd like to tell your potential customers, your partners, those who are very interested in what is happening in the industrial automation is there something you'd like to say a little bit, maybe something fun as well? <laughs> well, um, one day no fun uh, is uh, one day uh, spent. Eh? So uh, <laughs> that's uh, actually really very important. And that's what we try to encourage, not only uh, the two of us, because we are sitting uh, still in the same room and uh, I assure you, uh, we also have lots of fun, but we also try to encourage that to our people uh, that work for us. And uh, like I said, uh, we are um, actually aiming at a growth where we will have uh, a turnover of more than 100 million euros uh, in the next couple of years. And uh, then we are actually in the field of uh, the automation and of the, the, well, the complexity of systems uh, that we uh, can do. Right now we do that already in, uh, in the, this area, especially in uh, Belgium, Netherlands and, and, and Germany. Uh, but um, we also want to do that in the United States and in China where we have our subsidiaries with our group of people. Uh, at this, at this time we have uh, 250 people, uh, but uh, well, I can imagine that uh, this uh, growth fig figures uh, will also uh, happen in, in these countries. Well, I, I'd just like to say thank you. And I'd like to thank Sandra, who is overseeing your, your growth in North America experience, 25 years of experience and incredibly able, uh, able business woman in North America. So I just want to say thank you to you both for making this happen and for coming for your time and for coming on the show. Okay, uh, it was nice uh, to talk with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Paul. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Bye.